What is the one piece of advice that you feel is most important for someone who is going through that transition from short-term to long-term disability? I would say take it one step at a time. Take your time filling out the forms to make sure that the information is accurate and complete. Talk to your doctor before the doctor fills out the form to make sure that the doctor provides the correct or the relevant information, really what the insurance company is looking for. Uh, I think those two pieces of advice are the most important because the form is the first thing the insurance companies are looking at. And if they're complete and if they're accurate and they provide all of the relevant information, things will go much more smoothly. That's Kim Patnode, employment lawyer at Ravenlaw in Ottawa. She's our guest today talking about long-term disability insurance on this episode of Concussion Central, the podcast that changes the way you get your information about concussions. Hi, and welcome to Concussion Central. I'm your host, David McGuffin. Our aim on this podcast is to help you, the listener, navigate the often very confusing world of concussions, diagnosis, treatment, and more. And we understand that for those living with a concussion, the best way to receive information isn't reading material, it isn't online, it isn't on a screen, it's by listening. We hear you. So in this podcast, we'll be bringing you regular audio interviews with some of the world's leading experts on the many aspects of concussions. Earlier this season, we spoke to James Cameron, a partner at Ravenlaw, on the various legal aspects of overcoming a concussion. People think that their house is their biggest asset. In actual fact, their biggest asset is their ability to work. Today, we're thrilled to have his colleague Kim Patnode with us to help us get a handle on long-term disability insurance. With roughly 50% of long-term disability claims being rejected, it is one of the biggest areas of legal contention for those with a concussion. So, Kim Patnode, welcome to the Concussion Central podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's really, really great to have you here. And we're here to sort of follow up on a conversation we had with your, your colleague, James Cameron, and to drill down on long-term disability, which I think is something not, a lot of people probably aren't really even aware of or have, only have a vague idea that it exists and maybe they think it's some sort of government program. or what. So if we could just start with the very nuts and bolts basics of what is long-term disability. So long-term disability insurance coverage is um, insurance coverage that individuals usually have through their employment uh, in their benefits package with their employer. Individuals can also have personal coverage, LTD coverage, Usually it's people who are self-employed or who need additional coverage over and above what uh, the employer provides. And it's, it's, it's peace of mind insurance. It's protection in the event that you should no longer be able to work due to illness or injury. Fantastic. So most likely, as you're saying, most likely through the workplace. Um, so I guess the, the first question, if you're sort of heading into this zone then is, do I have it? And I guess that's possibly a question for HR. I mean, what, would that be an HR question right away? Yeah, absolutely. You would reach out to your the human resources department with your employer if there is a human resources department or whomever, you, yeah. your boss, your supervisor. Um, uh, and uh, then you go from there, essentially. Uh, they would um, provide you with, you probably have, or sorry, maybe the other options to look at your benefit booklet. Oftentimes when you get hired, you get access to a benefit booklet. Nowadays, mm. it's mostly an online benefit booklet. And that sets out all of the, the benefits that you have associated with your, um, your benefit its policy and that if you have LTD insurance, it would be mm-hmm. uh, included in that be- benefit booklet. Mm-hmm. So to get onto long-term disability, you need to transition from short-term disability. And I guess we should even so talk about what, what that is and where that's coming from. So um, short-term disability uh, is exactly that. It's short-term. It's it's from the moment the person becomes ill and unable to work, then an individual would go on short-term disability. Some employers do provide coverage for short-term disability. Some do not. Uh, so it really depends on the individual employer and the benefits that are provided. Um, and so the individ- an individual who becomes ill or unwell and unable to work would go on short-term disability for a specific period of time. And then at some point would transition to long-term disability insurance, depending on the insurance policy. Uh, and normally what, what that's called, it's an in- elimination period. 
So uh, normally, mm -hmm. uh, in order to have access to LTD, you have to um, uh, finish the elimination period before you get onto LTD. So what I mean, we're gonna, there's going to be a lot of terms around this, I think, too. And yeah. what, is an, what is an elimination period? An el elimination period is the period of time you have to wait before you can apply to a long term disability. Um, that is usually provided for in the terms of the policy or you would have a, have a look at the benefit uh pamphlet and it's usually indicated in the benefit pamphlet. Typically the elimination period is three to four months. Um, I've seen longer elimination periods as well. Usually the longer elimination period is because the employer uh, provides for a, a very comprehensive short-term disability plan. Um, so, but typically it's three to four months. You have to um, uh, wait three to four months before having access to, it, to the LTD uh, benefits. So we've talked about elimination periods. I mean, are there time limits involved in getting these getting these applications in? That's a really good question, David. Um, my recommendation is always to get the forms and fill them out as soon as possible if you do anticipate that the recovery will take longer than the elimination period for the application for LTD. Um, but uh, every policy usually has a time limit to apply, and it's usually 90 days after uh, the elimination period. So um, getting in the forms in before that 90 day time limit is, is important. It's not something that we can't overcome down the road if, if it's denied because you filed it out of time. Um, very often we can negotiate with the insurance company um, to extend that time limit, uh, especially if the delay is due to the person's disability and illness. Uh, they couldn't focus, they couldn't fill out the forms, it took them forever to fill out the forms or it took them too much time to get to their uh, to the specialist or their family doctor to get, fill out the forms. So there's, you know, there are ways to around that, but uh, in order not to have any issues, it's always best to file within the time limit. Great. So presumably it's a, it's a lower bar to clear to get the, yes, the short-term disability and then the long-term disability is a, it's a, probably a more onerous process. And I'm just, what's the best steps to make that as seamless a, a, a process as possible? So the first thing uh, that I would say is, first of all, find out whether or not there's a long-term disability coverage. If there is, uh, then ha get access or ask for the forms that you need to fill out. Typically, most insurance uh, policies have uh, three forms that are required to be filled out in order to apply for LTD benefits. Uh, the first form you have to fill out, providing uh, some information about yourself, your 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 job, uh, your disability, and why you're unable to work. Your employer usually has to fill out a, uh, a form as well, uh, providing information about, about your job, your position, the, the tasks that you do. And then your doctor has a form to fill out. Uh, and in my view, that's the most important yeah. form <laughs> uh, because they'll, the insurance company will be looking at uh, the, the diagnosis, the symptoms. They will, they will be looking at the form filled out by your doctor in order to determine whether or not you're eligible for the long-term disability benefit. Yeah. And there's a, and there's a term total disability that figures into this. Is that correct? Or? Yeah. So uh, that's an, it's, it's, it's a term that's uh, found in, in any uh, LTD policy, but it's defined uh, by, it's defined in the LTD policy and uh, it is, it can be different from policy to policy. So you have to look at what the definition is for your long-term disability policy. And um Typically, for the first 24 months of long-term disability, the definition is totally disabled for performing the, the tasks and duties of your own position, your own job. Great. So uh, so the doctor, as you were saying, is probably the most important of those three forms. And so dealing with concussions, and we've talked a lot about this on this podcast, is that we're, we're dealing with what's often described as an invisible injury. It's like people can't necessarily tell right. by the way you're walking or interacting or that you have a concussion. So what are the keys from the doctor perspective to getting that form filled in correctly? So um, the key is to uh, demonstrate that the individual meets the definition of total disability. So what we ask doctors to do in filling out the forms is to explain the nature, the extent, and the severity of this, the disabling condition. Uh, and this, in reference to the symptoms uh, that an individual has, um, will go a long way towards uh, having the, the claim accepted. 
What's also important is that the doctor include a description of the restrictions that the disabling condition has on the person's everyday life. The AOLs, activities of daily living that we, uh, that uh, it's how they're often described. So the ability to do chores, ability to interact with other individuals, uh, participate participating in sports. If the person who suffers from concussion used to be a super active person and all of a sudden they could no longer participate as a result of the concussion, that would be important. So anything that the individual can and can't do um, following the concussion, that'll be important to uh, include in the report or you know, sometimes those forms are very, have, you know, small spaces for the doctor to fill out. And, and we have doctors with their chicken scratches putting, uh, <laughs> trying to fill out the forms. You know, there's no harm in, in, in mm-hmm. uh, appending a letter uh, mm-hmm. where the doctor would describe exactly how having the concussion or post-concussion syndrome would affect the person's uh, everyday activities of everyday li- life. That's really interesting because I wouldn't have thought of the sort of everyday living stuff like the sports. And I mean, I would have thought it would be very specifically focused on the job at hand. Like you can't look at a screen or whatever that might be. But but it's interesting that it's much broader. It is. uh, But they they also look at Mm. the activities of daily living, because if you can do your if you can, you know, play a sport, if you can um, take care of your kids, make dinner. um, Those are things that the insurance company sometimes looks at in order to determine whether or not you'd be able to return to work. But yes, David, thanks for mentioning that, because I think it is also an important part of um, what the doctor needs to put in is how. how the disability, how the concussions and the symptoms related to concussions affect the person's um, ability to do their work. So in in the specific case, for example, of concussions, unable to uh, look at a screen for a significant period of time, dis- uh, inability to concentrate, uh, light sensitivity, whatever symptoms of the concussion um, are ongoing and are disabling, making a link between the symptoms and the ability to do the person's job. I mean, you also mentioned too, um, there are companies that can help with filling out forms. Is that something you recommend? Or you... Uh, uh, rec- yes. I mean, if, if you're having a hard time filling out the forms and uh, you need some help, uh, then yes, get get the advice and the and the assistance of someone who who's a specialist in the area who can help move you through um, through the steps. Whether it's a lawyer, whether it's a paralegal, whether it's there there are actually other specialists out there who don't have any specific legal training but have you know some human resource training or some other types of training that um, that um, makes gives them some expertise in the area. Um, just do your homework and do some research and get some ref- referrals, recommendations. And so there, there are people out there who can help. Mm-hmm. If you're unionized, go to your union. Uh, sometimes unions uh, do have individuals uh, working with the union or at the union who can help out with these mm-hmm. these kinds of forms as well. So in your experience, and obviously the, the lawyer aspect of this, the employment lawyer aspect of this often comes in when there's been a problem in getting long-term disability. So what what are the main issues you're seeing? And I guess we'll drill down on the doctor because that seems like the main, main pr- problem area. What is the main issues you're seeing on a regular basis that need to be overcome? Absolutely. So unfortunately, people come to see us when when they're denied their long term disability uh, insurance. Uh, we can assist ahead of time. And sometimes it is good to to consult with with uh, either a lawyer or, or um, there are individuals out there who help people fill out uh, disability claim forms. Um, and what we see most often is that claims are denied mm-hmm. because there's insufficient medical information uh, or there's no objective medical evidence or the, the forms aren't clear enough or there's not enough detailed information on the forms. And that's why it's important for the doctor to really um, get into the nature, extent uh, and yeah. severity of the disabling condition. And again, it goes back to this invisible injury thing, um, you know, and it, it seems like there's a, it, almost a higher bar you have to clear because it is invisible. Is that correct? It can seem that way. Uh, it's the invisible disability and it's the um, access to objective medical evidence. If, if there could be, if 
if the doctor can provide objective medical evidence of the disabling condition, it's a lot easier for the insurance company to accept a claim. It's when the claim is very subjective. Um, uh, you know, an individual says, I'm tired all the time. Uh, I can't focus. Um, those kinds of uh, disabling symptoms are hard to measure. Uh, and sometimes uh, in those cases, the claims are denied because there's no objective medical evidence. One thing we've heard on this podcast, too, is that um, family doctors tend to be, by their nature of their business, very positive people. <laughs> very bad, <And>, yes. <laughs> and we, as humans, as, as a species, I think we also tend to want to focus Absolutely. on the positive. Unfortunately, sometimes insurance um, companies will latch on to the positive aspects of someone's recovery to say, yes, you're, you're, you're getting better, you're on the road to recovery, and therefore you should be able to return to work. Um, there, you can have good days and bad days. Uh, you know, we, as an, you know, human nature, we want to focus on the good days and the positives and, and moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes, you know, one positive day doesn't mean you're, you're able to return to work. Uh, it might be a stepping stone, but um, unfortunately, insurance companies tend to latch on to those positive days to, to push individuals to return to work. So it's not out of the realm then to necessarily ask your doctor to redo a form or to, you know, if you're feeling like oh, this is way more positive than I'm actually feeling, is, is, I mean, is that a reasonable request to make? Normally what we would do is is ask the, the doctor to provide a supplementary report, um, perhaps mm -hmm. attaching the, the, the uh, file notes uh, mm -hmm. where, you know, in, an individual is describing the symptoms over a period of time. Um, so, and, and folk, and what we would ask the doctor to do is focus on the symptoms, the ongoing symptoms, and how they do affect uh, an individual's ability to work. Uh, so it's, I mean, the doctor can either fill out the form uh, again or append uh, an additional report to clarify some of his answers, his, his or her mm -hmm. answers. And is there a benefit to having a family doctor as opposed to going to a, a specialist like a neurologist or someone like well, that? Well, if you have access to an, a specialist, neurologist, um, or a concussion specialist, uh, then um, it's, al it's always best to have uh, a medical report from the specialist. Um, unfortunately, oftentimes what we see is an individual sees a specialist uh one time, uh, and that's it. There's no ongoing relationship. So it's difficult to get the specialist to fill out the form. Uh, but the family doctor is kind of the holder of all information. All of the specialist reports goes to the family doctor. And what the family doctor can and should do is uh, refer to the specialist report and the diagnosis and the symptoms that are that are reported um, by the by the specialist so that uh, the the claim can be accepted. So you've done all this, you've got the forms in, are you I mean, should you be expecting as a concussion sufferer, should be you expecting a call from the insurance company, or what, I mean, what 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 are the steps now that you've you've got the the ball in in motion? Uh, well, I'll give you the typical lawyer answer. It depends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it depends on the insurance company. It depends on the process. It depends on what kind of information you provided in uh, with your application, whether or not the forms are mm. complete, uh, whether or not there's insufficient information in the form. So sometimes uh, an individual mm. will get a call from the insurance company. Um, again, you know, uh, when an insurance agent, or it actually wouldn't be an insurance agent, it would be a case manager calls. Um, um, oftentimes, they mm -hmm. ask individuals a series of questions. It can be a stressful uh, situation. Um, and, you know, individuals mm -hmm. sometimes are worried about saying the wrong thing. Uh, they get caught at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they call out of the blue. So you could be rushing to do something else or not focused on what you need to focus on by to answer their questions. So um, my recommendations is if you can't um, answer their questions right away, if you're not up to it, uh, ask for them to send the questions mm -hmm. in writing um, uh, and then take yeah. the time to uh, to answer the questions and send them back or schedule another time for a call where you're anticipating their call and their questions so that uh, you, you prepare yourself mentally for the fact that you're going to be answering questions for the insurance company. Company. So you'll get adequate sleep or you'll you'll schedule the call at a moment where it's you're you might be at your best to answer the calls. Right. And, and again, it goes back to not being overly positive. So <laughs> probably don't don't tell them you feel you're feeling great or you're, you're... I mean, 
my the answer is always to tell the truth, right? You're yeah, you're yeah. you know you you maybe had a good day yesterday, but today you know you you overdid it the the, the mm-hmm. previous day, and and you're feeling the the effects of that. Um, so yes. You know, don't be overly optimistic and overly positive. Uh, but my the the answer is always to tell the truth. Right, but don't don't hold back on what the problems are too. I guess. Well, absolutely, and that's we have a tendency to do that, especially women. Uh, we we hide our problems, or we hide uh, we are um, we want to be strong. We don't want to appear weak. Uh, so oftentimes we see that uh, we see that difficulty, uh, especially in women. They don't they don't exaggerate their symptoms. They they t- quite the opposite. They uh, they minimize right. uh, their symptoms, etc. And that's not like if you uh, if you're unwell and unable to, unable to work, you don't want to minimize your symptoms. You want to you want to be accurate mm-hmm. uh, as accurate as possible. Yeah. So just just be aware that they are probably la- looking to latch on to anything that seems like it's there isn't a problem. Exactly. So I think we'll, let's get to the point where you, you're most often going to get involved. And what if you've gone through all this process, you've got all the paperwork filled out, you've you know maybe even taken a call, but what if you're now denied long-term disability? What do you do then? Uh, well, you have to look at the reasons for denial. Uh, the, the number one reason for denial is, is insufficient medical uh, information. So um, if, if, if that's the case, uh, there's always the opportunity to appeal the decision. And if you can get more additional medical information, additional medical document, if you can get, um, if since you've applied, you've actually seen a specialist, because sometimes, unfortunately, it takes a long time mm-hmm. to see a specialist, and now you have this new medical information from a specialist, then you can appeal the decision with this new medical information in order to uh, ask the insurance company to over, to, to change their decision. Um, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing is... Um, uh, you can consult with with a legal professional, uh, with a lawyer, uh, in order to um, pursue litigation. So the two options in terms of denial are are appealing the decision with new medical information or litigation, which means issuing a statement of claim and pursuing uh, the insurance company in court. Okay, well, let's separate those out. I mean, I mean, if you've been <laughs> denied. Um, as a lawyer, are you helping people to, to, to do the reapplication? Is I mean, is it worth getting someone well, to help you with at that point? Well, it's not it's not a reapplication. It's a it's an, an appeal. appeal. So yeah. you're providing them with new medical information, and we do help individuals with with appeals. Uh, the sex, success, success rate is mitigated because usually an insurance company will not change its mind unless it gets new mm-hmm. medical information. Mm-hmm. They usually they won't. Off, very often they won't say, "Oh, whoops, we made a mistake." You know, yes, you were you were entitled to long term disability benefits. Uh, typically, appeals are or, or decisions are are overturned when uh, there is new medical information. So what we do is sometimes we help clients get that new medical mm-hmm. information. We refer them to a specialist or to an occupational therapist, uh, get a medical report, and um, uh, submit it to the insurance company for con- to for consideration in an appeal. Mm. Uh, and sometimes we are successful. Um, How long is that process more, generally? It really depends on the issues and, and, and the insurance company. Sometimes the appeal process can take a long time before we actually get an ultimate decision. Uh, but there is a time limit within which someone must appeal the decision. Um, and it, I think it would vary uh, based on the insurance policy. It can be 30 days, it can be 60, it can be 90. So litigation, what is, what is that? I mean, obviously that's a much... Much more difficult road. That's a bigger yeah, step. that's a bigger step. That's a, it's a it's a bigger step because uh, you could do it on your own, but typically people tend to engage uh, legal services the from from either uh, an employment lawyer uh, or other um, personal injury uh, lawyers. Um, so they would engage uh, a, a law firm in order to file uh, a statement of claim with with the courts, uh, and then what we're doing is claiming for uh, what you're entitled to under the insurance policy, which is the ongoing disability benefits. Uh, and then that that is uh, a process in and of itself. We could probably do a separate podcast mm-hmm. all about that <laughs> because there are a number of steps to litigation. But the first step is to uh, file a statement of claim and get the claim going. And typically, unless there's a, um, a clause in the, in the insurance policy that um, – uh, limits or, or provides a new time limit. Typically, it's two years to to sue an insurance company once the decision or once the decision comes out denying the claim. Okay, and 
How, how involved are you as a, a client or a, you know a concussion sufferer in this case? Um, how involved are you going to be in that whole process? Like what? I mean, what are the typical steps? Matt? So typical steps. Well, what we do is we meet with the client. Uh, we go over the situation. We we talk to the client about their their illness, their disability, their 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 symptoms, the um, how how it's. Uh, disabling them in their activities of daily life and as well as uh, in their work. Uh, we gather uh, information from uh, their their treating physicians, whether it's their, uh, yes, the family doctor, all the specialists. Um, we get uh, the insurance file and what we do is we, we gather all that information and we draft a statement of claim. Uh, typically, we do the majority of the work. Uh, we, we were the ones who are getting uh, all of these uh, documents, the files, uh, to review in order to draft the statement of claim. Uh, and then what we would ask of, of um, the client is simply to review the statement of claim to make sure that what we're saying is accurate. Uh, and then we, we take care of filing it with the court. And then after that, you know, the insurance company will defend the, uh, the, the claim and uh, we engage in the litigation process. The, the individual is involved in every step of the process, but the, the involvement is not... Um, how do I say? It's not extremely intense uh, in the sense that they're sitting there drafting documents, mm. et cetera. We're, we're, we're doing the heavy lifting. Right. Uh, the client is providing us with instructions. Yeah. Well, that's an encouraging thing to hear, especially if you have a concussion. <laughs> so. Yeah, and and we're we're very much aware um, of of our clients' limitations and restrictions, so we try to accommodate as much as possible. I mean, we've had, uh, you know, for example, in the case of someone suffering from a concussion, we've had kind of dark meetings where we shut off all the lights and and it's the uh, the boardroom is very somber, uh, so that the individual is not affected by um, because oftentimes uh, people who suffer from concussions have light sensitivity, so uh, we've had uh, meetings with all the lights off, um, limited, limited, um, uh, access to electronics. So we, we do what we can, uh, we, you know, have short meetings. We don't, you know, have meetings that last an hour, um, to, you know, we try to do it in little bites so that, uh, the individual is able to focus, um, on what's needed to what the individual needs to focus on for the period of time. Uh, and then we take it kind of like in baby steps. Yeah. Well, that's excellent advice, not just for people with concussions, but for the, the lawyers who are helping them too. So thank you for sh <laughs> sharing all those tips because that is really obviously a big issue. So James, when we talked, James Cameron, when we spoke to him, said, you know, generally people come to lawyers almost when it's too late, <laughs> you know, or it's like the, <laughs> they really would like them to come to you earlier. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. I absolutely agree. Um, if uh, an individual comes to us right off the bat while filling out the forms, while communicating with their doctor about what to put into the forms, sometimes we can provide advice that would assist in getting on to the benefits. Um, we've had a few clients reach out to us uh, as they're filling out long-term disability forms, uh, and we've provided advice uh, to the client and to the doctor about filling out the forms and, and how best to provide the information so that the insurance company truly understands understands what uh, what the issue, what this disability is and how it's affecting the individual's ability to work. Fantastic. Well, Kim Patnow, thank you so much for coming on Concussion Central. This is a real pleasure and I, I think we learned a lot. Thank you. It was my pleasure as well. And thank you for listening. And a special thanks goes out to Ravenlaw for their support of this podcast. If you enjoy Concussion Central, please do us a big favor and give us a five-star rating and write a glowing review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. I know it's a bold ask, but the way the algorithm works, that's the single best way for these interviews to reach as wide an audience as possible. And remember to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. For more information on the work of Concussion Central, you can visit us at concussioncentral.ca. Until next time, I'm David McGuffin.